I'm going to pose a question to the, the two panelists, and then anybody else can chime in. But as that, uh, they're answering, I'm going to be walking around. How many of you are introverts? Believe it or not, I'm very much of an introvert. I psych myself up when I come to OPE, do some other things, because this is what is expected. But I have to go and get my quiet time. I have to go and just get, it has some little solitude. Um, so, in honor of you all, I'm going to be walking around and handing out some um, um, cards. If, you're, if you have a question, all you have to do is fill it out and then just hold it up and come back and pick it up and that way you don't have to speak. Um, so we'll take it from there. So the first question goes to Tyrone and Mary. What is student affairs and why should they want to enter this field? What is student affairs? Student affairs is one of those professions that is no like nothing like any other. Uh, you think about the types of experiences that you gain, the types of skills that you are able to attain, and you can you basically do, actually, let me rephrase, rephrase for saying basically, you can do anything with those skills. That's what student affairs is all about. You're, you're branching over in so many areas. It's not just residence, how, housing and residence life, it's counseling, it's student activities, it's career planning placement. It's just, uh, you name it, some of the things, financial aid. You're getting unhandsed experiences like no other. And that's why those of you who have been RAs or CAs, uh, you probably have heard folks say that you will have experiences that folks, some folks will never understand. Others will say that it will set you apart from others. In regards to the amount of leadership skills that you gain from this experience, it is really like an education without being around a traditional classroom. You look at the amount of knowledge that you gain from this experience and the ability to interpret the policies, the practices, the philosophies, and you execute those. There really is a new job that exists like this, and that's what makes students fair so So um, I, I would say on many campuses, student affairs uh, is a pretty broad term. So in some places, it takes in all of those specific offices in addition to housing and residence life, career center, financial aid, sometimes admissions, um, sometimes athletics, recreational sports. So this is such a perfect training ground. It's such a generalist field. How many of you in the audience were never an RA? Neither was I. So don't be sitting there afraid that you're not going to be hireable right now. Again, what Nick said is to talk about just being yourself, relaying your experiences, demonstrating that you understand the demands of the positions you're interviewing for. What I love about student affairs and why student affairs is it keeps you young. It keeps you in touch with what's happening in the world. It makes you think about a policy that's maybe always been a certain way. Some student will walk through the door and challenge, and you really have to give thought and consideration to, yeah, does it still make sense if we do it that way? I never thought about that. So you're always learning, you're always engaged, you have the opportunity to really make a difference in someone else's life. You have the opportunity, if you're doing it well, to uh, model balance, to um, use good reflection skills and really examining what are you doing? What's your vision? Are you working towards your goal? There's no more rewarding field, I think, than when you find a job that matches your soul. In addition, for those of you who are going to enter the um, a graduate program, this is going to be a one or two or perhaps three year experience for you. Give serious consideration to the breadth of student affairs. Some of you may think I want to be in housing forever. That's wonderful. Some of you may say, you know, housing's okay, but academic advising is something I really like. Or career services or student activities. Take this opportunity in your graduate program to pursue these different options that you have. Um, and it's wonderful to be able to stay on a college campus and enjoy all the benefits and knowing that there are some fields within student affairs that you can go home at 6 o'clock and a phone isn't going to ring 
You don't have to worry about the fire alarm going off or any other types of behaviors that may exist. So. Question number two, posed to Jolene and Lynn. What preparation is required for jobs, careers, and student affairs? I'm on the spot. Um, I've, I've been thinking about this a lot. So I said that my first OPE was 11 years ago. And I had a nervous breakdown in my supervisor's office in January because I was graduating in April and I had no idea what I was going to do with my life. And I didn't realize that he had a real job. And he said, well, don't you like this? And I said, yes. And he said, well, there's this thing called OPE. You should go check it out. I hadn't taken the GRE, I hadn't even thought about grad school, I, 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 got, I interviewed for graduate assistantships before I ever even applied to grad school. That's the way you don't do it. And it's possible to do it. Um, I think that, you know, in line with what everybody else has said, the great thing about student affairs is there's not one right way to do things. If you talk to each of us up here about how we got involved and how we got to where we are today, there are, you know, infinite correct paths. Um, the thing that I would say is, you know, thinking long term about what kinds of experiences you want, um, I would say it's sort of a sliding scale. So, and this isn't always true, but if you're looking at smaller institutions, I think generally you can expect to um, need less education. Um, you might not need a master's degree to work in housing in a, at a smaller institution, uh, but if you're looking at like a larger institution, like big public schools, uh, for those entry-level positions, you probably need a master's degree, um, and a graduate assistantship would help you kind of get your foot in the door for those kinds of experiences. But um, a mentor told me once, it's not your job to decide if you're qualified, it's your job to apply. Um, so if your dream job is out there and calling to you, let them decide um, if you're the right fit for that. Um, and then you can kind of see where things go. And what I will add to that is that I believe to work in student affairs, um, you should have a passion for working with students, so working with people like you. Um, you should have a curiosity, a willingness to learn, a willingness to take risks, um, that interest in that commitment to being a team member as well as a team leader. And, and I think that's really what it takes. You know, oftentimes we hear that answer of, well, why do you want to be an RA? Why do you want to be a student? Well, I love people. Great, we all love people, um, some more than others. I, but I think it is, how can you equate that even further? I want to be a part of a team. I want to make a difference. I want to influence change. I want to help somebody be successful in whatever, however they define success. That, I think, is what is necessary to be a part of this incredible profession. And a love of fire alarms, absolutely. <laughs> and drunk students, and what else? Yeah. Vomit, vomit is good. Yeah, knowing how to clean that up, is, or cover it up, is good. So, yeah, okay. At the UW Lacrosse, I don't understand what's this vomit stuff you're talking about. Okay. We have policies okay. against that. Okay, are we not in the land of beer? Sorry. And I've worked here in Wisconsin. I don't understand that either. <laughs> Cheese. I think one of the preparations that you need to have is that I would encourage that you need to have a continual and ongoing desire to learn. You're going to get older. You're going to constantly work with 18 to 22 year olds. And believe it or not, the issues that I had when I was 18 to 22 are a whole lot different than the issues that current 18 to 22 year olds um, experience. And you need to be able to understand some of those differences. And you need to be able to change, develop some different ways of approaching issues. But your preparation begins with, as they said, enjoying what you do. And working with 18 to 22 year olds 
and beyond if you, depending upon the type of campus that you are associated with. It, it is very important that as you prepare yourself, knowing, know that you will become rich. Not financially, but you will become rich in the fact that you have the opportunity to interact and impact others, to display the best part of being human as you work with individuals, 18 to 22 year olds, as they go through this process of deciding who am I? What do I believe? What do I value? Well, why am I here? Sounds like I'm, I'm talking about college student development theory, which is a class that I teach. But that is indeed a fascinating subject in working with individuals as they try to understand who they are and what impact they need to make um, in the world. And it jumped up and grabbed me. <laughs> anyway, question number three. This is for um, Gilbert and Alan. Could you talk about, are there different types of graduate programs out there? Thank you. Uh, there are different ways to prepare yourself with, with graduate programs. Uh, there are counseling programs, there are graduate level, what we refer to as an educational leadership program. Uh, depending on your interest, uh, there are people in counseling psych programs, educational psychology, and now and then we'll see people in uh, student affairs positions with uh, backgrounds in communication and a few other um, fields. I don't want to say this and sound like I'm biased because I have other friends up here who may have other ideas too, but uh, having come from a counseling background myself, <clears throat> I really believe in it. And the reason I say that is I had a thorough training in college student development. And since the folks that you're going to work with are college students, it's important, as Nick was referring to, that you understand who they are and what they're going through at that developmental stage in life, whether they be traditional age or even sometimes non-traditional students. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating field, as Nick has said. Uh, I, I really believe that learning uh, in, in a graduate program where you have a, an opportunity to understand college student development and as well student affairs and how student affairs operates and what it is, the philosophies underlying student affairs go way back into the uh, 1930s and 1940s, sometimes even before that, will help you and help you not only to build your content knowledge but a set of skills so that when you're working with students one-on-one -on -one or in groups and they're facing challenges, you know, they come to campus with all kinds of things today emotional challenges and financial difficulties and all kinds of things. And your training will help you to be insightful enough to be able to um, conceptualize what it is perhaps that they're struggling with and therefore be more effective in helping them so that they can succeed. So uh, maybe, that's a, maybe that's a good enough start. Gilbert, do you want to add to that? Well, uh, my colleagues shared, you, shared with us some perspectives about the types of uh, student affairs master's programs that exist around the country. I like, to, I like to approach this topic in a different way by thinking about why is it that institutions of higher education exist. Stakeholders are entities, individuals who have an interest in your institution. And two of our major external stakeholders are state governments along with parents. And they would say that institutions uh, uh, exist in order to help uh, young people acquire skills that lead to jobs. Okay? 
So, so degree attainment is increasingly important in institutions of higher education. With this in mind, how is it, what is the role of student affairs within an institution? I think that uh, each program will help you uh, get your arms wrapped around that topic. But at Missouri State, uh, one of the things that we believe is important is for uh, student affairs uh, professionals to have a skill set that allows them to uh, play a key role in partnering with uh, our faculty colleagues to foster student success, which ultimately, ultimately means degree attainment. So our curriculum is based on the CAS standards. What I mean by the CAS standards, the Council for Standards in Higher Education. Those are the standards that outline the national benchmarks for exemplary student affairs programs. So when you look at different types of student affairs programs, you want to look at the uh, all, look at the uh, OPE website, look at ACUHO website, ACPA and NASPA are the two major umbrella organizations for student affairs, and you look to see whether or not those programs that you're interested in are they aligned with the CAS standards, because those CAS standards are are shaping the curriculum at those exemplary schools. And is at those exemplary schools is where you will acquire those, uh, those experiences in the classroom that will uh, complement the things that you're learning in your GA position. Because I believe there are probably about seven factors that shape how you become a student affairs professional. And let me list some of those. One of those has to do, again, with uh, your peers. And what I mean by your peers, your peers within your student affairs program, because they're bringing different ideas within the program. Secondly, uh, through your what we call supervised practice, supervised practice is a term that we use to describe the experiences that you learn in student affairs in your GA position along with your practicum. Your practicum is really an academic internship experience. Okay? So those are two, those are good learning situations. Another good learning situation revolves around attending professional conferences, not just to look for positions, but to use that as continuing education. Another area that we want to try to uh, emphasize, you know, revolves around the importance of uh, what you learn from being around people who are mentors. Mentor is someone who's taken interest in your career, and he or she may not be your direct supervisor. So when you factor in all those different uh, areas, these are different learning situations that help you become a student affairs uh, professional. And so that administrative focus is one of the main, uh, I would say, areas that in Missouri State we try to focus on. But I'm not going to say the institutions uh, where I take my education that it wouldn't be fair because I have two master's degrees. One of them is in counselor education, the other one is in student affairs. One of the reasons why I ended up with a degree in student affairs is because I felt like the degree in counselor education did not prepare me for a, the pathway in administration. Because when you're a student affairs professional, you're managing programs, services, budgets, supervision, and that kind of, uh, those kind of experiences are, are more so associated with the administrative focus of student affairs. The counseling approach in student affairs puts more of an emphasis on your uh, individual relationships with uh, students resolving conflicts. It doesn't place a lot of emphasis on uh, helping uh, young people earn their degrees. One of my favorite YouTube clips is called The Dash. And what it really addresses, when you go to a cemetery, you just see so-and-so, 19, 20 to, you know, 2010. Those are nice figures. But what's important is that dash. And I equate that to the graduate program. You're going to be in a graduate program from, say, fall of 14 through um, uh, May of 16. What's that dash say? What did you learn? What did you experience? How did you answer the question, you don't know that you don't know what you don't know? <coughs> Listen to that. You don't know that you don't know what you don't know. This is a question graduate schools will help you answer. 
It's not necessarily the answer that's important. It's that process that you go through to find out and uncover some of the limitations that we have with inside, inside us. And we make decisions based on our own experience, and we're not factoring in the experiences of others. But learning, exploring difference. And Gilbert had mentioned that you're going to be part of a cohort. You're going to come in with 16 to 20 other individuals into the same field. You're going to experience the same thing. You can be with these people in every class. And you experience and you share. My term is, is go over and you have a beverage of your choice and you talk smart. You engage in an intellectual conversation. This is what the graduate programs hopefully are able to create the different kinds of cultures that permit you to engage in some higher level conversations and really discuss issues and to explore some of the limitations we have based on our own upbringing. Graduate programs, they have different titles. Some are um, on campus, some are online. Different focuses. Not or the same focus, but taught differently. Some are one year, two year, three years, depending upon um, the standards or the um, um, criteria that they use to award a degree. Um, take a look at those sorts of things. Again, if you take a look at the program directors, I think you'll see that when I say exemplary programs, exemplary programs are graduate programs whose curriculum and the sum total of their experiences align with those benchmarks. Most of your exemplary programs have between 42 and 48 credit hours. So that's a degree that needs to be completed in two years. Okay. Now, uh, I think we all know it's cold outside. And when you have to have gloves on, you need to find gloves that fit you. Well, when you're looking for a graduate program, you need to find one that fits you. And with one of those criteria you should pay, you should pay attention to, again, is the curriculum, the nature of the uh, graduate uh, uh, supervision that you'll be getting, how does that particular program place emphasis on your involvement with the professional associations where you can have some continued education? How, how do they talk about, what, how, do they bring, how do they bring in the experiences of graduate students along with the faculty members? Because we like to try to construct the classroom environment that is based upon some of the characteristics that you bring into the program along with the characteristics of the faculty member. So when you do that, you have a pretty good, rich teaching and learning environment. Because many of the faculty members, as an example like myself, I was in residence life for years. I never attended OPE uh, for, that's a uh, different story, but I was in residence life for 10 years. And you learn a great deal about uh, managing uh, an organization, supervising staff, and so you have a, a skill set where you could be considered kind of an all-around athlete because you do different things. You bring those experiences into the classroom and with your peers. And you just think about all the different experiences. You think about the experiences of the faculty member. You connect all these different experiences and try to take it to a higher level through the readings. And so when you do that, you start on this pathway of what we refer to as being a reflective practitioner. Last question I'm going to pose to the panelists um, and to Spencer and Bill. And as um, they are answering, I'm going to walk around and if you have a question that you've written down, hold it up and I'll be happy to, to pick it up. So, Spencer and Bill, should these folks attend graduate school or work full time first or can they do the same uh, at the same time? All right, that's a great question. We're talking a lot about graduate school curriculum. How many of you have been in school for, you know, four years, five years? A lot of you, you've been in school for a while. 
uh, for me as a candidate, first time to OP in 06. I've been an undergrad for five years, went to the University of Minnesota, loved my education, and I had that itch to just go work. Okay, I'm gonna tell you that right now. I came to OP, I was open-minded, I thought about graduate programs, and I was thinking about full-time programs. I was looking at all those postings, the ones that said, bachelor's required, master's preferred. But you, you thought, oh, I could sneak in there with my bachelor's, right? Um, and that's a hard road, I'm gonna be very honest with you. That's a hard road. Um, those are gonna be a lot of those smaller schools in the Midwest, typically a small private. Um, a couple of larger public schools I can think about off the top of my head. A Colorado State or a University of Minnesota will offer a bachelor's level kind of assistant hall director position that's 30 hours of full time. So those exist out there, but if you get that temptation, I'm not gonna say don't look at it, but I'm gonna tell you right now, it's gonna be a tough road where you may be very patient with that process. Um, it's very unlikely that someone's gonna apply with a bachelor's and get a full-time position two weeks after OP. That's gonna be more of a wait it out, hopefully get that call June, July. Um, whereas if you want to lock in where you're going in the future early on, figuring out that graduate assistantship role, because um, what I would say, as a professional, you need to get the master's. I worked two years full-time, and then I went to grad school. Um, came back to OP, did a search for grad schools, found a graduate position. You're gonna need that master's sometime. Maybe you want to feel out student affairs, and you say, okay, I'm not sure if this is for me, I really love it, but I don't know if I want to do it the rest of my life. You want to, that's, that was kind of my, my mindset. I came in, two years worked full-time, yep, loved it, yes, I want to stay in it, yes, I'm still here, I'm going to still be here. But there are two roads there. There are also some folks, there's some online programs coming on that, you know, the jury's kind of still out where the credibility is with an online program, but those exist there for distance learning, for hired programs. <coughs> there's a lot of different options out there. Can it be done while working full time? If you're in a supportive environment, that's gonna come from a supervisor and a department saying, yeah, we totally support you getting your education while you're here. Um, those are important questions to ask if you're interviewing at an institution that will allow you to work with, you know, at your bachelor's level? Would they be supportive of you taking classes, you know, part-time, distance learning, whatever that looks like? But those are great questions to ask yourself. What are you looking for, what fits, and what fits with the institution? All right. Microphones are all over the place here. All right, so um, I, I think just to echo a little bit what, what Spencer had said, it's, it just all comes down to your fit. It, it really is, um, what works for you if you can find um, if, if you really want to find that first full-time job and go off and, and work right up after you graduate you know by all means uh, fill out those applications go through the, the process and see if you can find that job it's it is difficult uh, especially as you see more and more postings coming out requiring a master's degree uh, you know it, typically when you're working in student affairs that's what you're going to be up against but the, the nice part about that is is that you know if you find that GA spot uh, those schools, for the vast majority of them, some of the smaller privates maybe not, but the vast majority of schools will pay for you to go to school. They'll pay you while you're there, and so it'll just be the ultimate benefit. You'll, you'll be a place that you know hopefully you want to be, uh, but they'll, you'll be getting paid, and you'll have your board paid for. You'll have uh, your, your tuition paid for. Those types of things. So it's the ultimate benefit of, of a GA spot when you can get one that pays for you to be there. Um, that, that's a huge thing, and obviously everyone fits when you're getting free money. But the, the, uh, the, the, the biggest thing there is, is you know, I don't think we can echo it enough, is, is just what's going to fit for you. Uh, the other thing about graduate programs when you're looking to go out is um, not just the, the graduate program, the curriculum, but also who's teaching that curriculum. Uh, you know, I went to a graduate program that stressed practitioner uh, faculty. And so we had faculty that, that weren't all just from that school. They were actually from several different schools. Uh, some of them were large public, some of them were small private. It just all depended upon you know, the faculty member. So it gave, what I loved about that is that it gave me a really great idea of what it's like to work in a large private institution or, or a large public institution, whatever, you know, what have you. Uh, it really gives a I worked in a small private, I worked in a large public. There are benefits and uh, you know pros and cons to both, but really um, in the end, you know I don't think I can stress this enough. It comes down to your fit and how you feel like you would do at that institution. Uh, I'm a little biased because I went and did my graduate work before I started working, so I always feel like that's 
that's a really good way to go. Uh, if you are going to go that way, look for the graduate assistantships as well, just to see if you can get that extra benefit uh, while you're in school. <laughs> out some of the, the questions for the, our panelists and I'll uh, give them a couple minutes to kind of take a look at it. We have a question from the, the field. <coughs> yes. Um, what would you recommend uh, to be option on the exam other sort of the basic thesis comprehensive? Uh, we need to think about what's the nature of student affairs. Student affairs is, a, is an applied field. And what I mean by applied field is you manage programs and services, you create learning uh, experiences. It's, the focus is on not creating knowledge, but on application. So if you look for a, uh, a final graduation event that measures what the profession uh, is about, I believe it is the uh, combination of the comprehensive exam along with the electronic portfolio. Because in your e-portfolio, e you're able to use your uh, different experiences supported by artifacts to demonstrate what you know. At the same time, the cash standards want you to demonstrate uh, that you wrap your arms around a certain body of knowledge within, student, within higher education student affairs. So it's that hybrid between uh, the e-portfolio and the conference act. A master's thesis uh, does not really capture the nature of what student affairs is about. I think there's a, um, and it, it depends upon the program you're gonna go into, and then say at my institution, you don't have a choice. We don't have comprehensive exams, and we don't do a thesis. We, we you, you do an applied research project. And then um, you can either, um, um, do a, a, a research project, or you can do what we call a JAM, a journal art, um, article manuscript. And you're going to do the research, but then you're going to um, put it in the form of um, a document that can be submitted for a journal. And that's what, uh, but each institution has their own criteria. And I think that as you engage in different, and take a look at different um, graduate programs, Take a look at what they're really going to require. Um, there's a body of thought out there that says if you want to go on and get your doctorate, you probably should do a thesis. Quite frankly, I'm not sold on that. You can do a lot of research um, in your graduate program. Um, but if there's an area that you're really passionate about, your doctoral, um, your dissertation can build upon what you did within your thesis. Can I offer something? Um, you know, as I listen to you and I listen to Gilbert, I think there's many good points made and there's a lot of information to take in. One other thing that I would add that I would encourage you to do as you look at graduate programs is not only do your research online, talk to people, and think about what it is you truly want to do, but um, you want to be able to interview. There are programs out there that don't have an extensive interview process. Um, I think that is important. I'll give you an example. Beginning next Friday and the Friday after, we're bringing in about 53 students over two days to interview them. Uh, it's a six-hour process where they meet with faculty. We do group activities. And the thing that's most important, though, I think, is not only do we get to know them, but we tell each and every one of the students in, in an orientation at the beginning of the day that we want them, number one, to be themselves, not try to be somebody that they think uh, we want them to be. And second of all, we want them to interview us, because we want them to determine if it's a good fit for them. You're going to be there for, our program is three years. You're going to be there, you're going to be, you're going to be involved a lot uh, in your cohort. And uh, there's a lot of personal growth involved in addition to classroom work. And so, you want to, you really want to get to know, as best you can, the program so that you can make the decision about whether or not you feel it's going to be a good fit for you. And speaking of fit, I have the question here, which um, asks, when looking for fit at an institution, 
Um, how do you determine that when you're sitting in a 30 minute interview or an hour interview to make sure that this is a good place for you? Um, and I don't think that that's the first step for you. I think the first step is to determine what kind of environment you think you need. Is there a particular geographical region? Is there a particular type of institution? Is it public? Is it private? Is it religiously affiliated in that private institution? Is it um, small, medium, large? So you take those kinds of things. What are you open to? What do you think would be a good mesh for you? For those of you looking at grad school, it's like two or three years of your life. You could do almost anything for two or three years of your life, be anywhere. So really encourage yourself to step out and try something that's unfamiliar, not just like your undergraduate years. Um, the other piece about fit is, in this day and age, I always say, there's no candidate that shouldn't come prepared to have a good understanding, or at least some understanding of the institution that they're interviewing with. You can research websites, you can look at videos that might be there, you can pay attention to Twitter feeds. There are so many things that can say, I like this. I kind of like how they're communicating with students, or I like what they say about this. That's another sign that maybe there's fit. And then there is that 30 minute interview or that hour long interview. Some schools might do second round interviews to give you a little bit more of uh, exposure to the people. And if you're finding that in that interview that you click, that you maybe you, there's a sense of humor, there's a, you know, an opportunity to think about things in deeper ways and that's who you are. There's, you really like a structured environment and maybe that's what they're talking about. The, the final thing that I would say is please go to that interview with good questions that will help you make apples to apples out of what is apples and oranges when you start this process. Thank you, Mary. Uh, question, what keeps you motivated to do your job? Three people walking out right now. <laughs> Sarah, <laughs> Ashley, and Keith. The three undergrads at UW-La Crosse. These are outstanding individuals. Every year, I get an opportunity to reach out and touch the lives of students. And you make impacts. And when someone comes up to you, even in a discipline situation, and says thank you, you know that you have done a good job. You should have stayed in your seats five more minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, bye. <laughs> I called them up, didn't I? <laughs> Another question. Can I just add to that? Um, I, I really feel like as far as staying motivated, one thing that I love about what I do is that I get, I get the opportunity, you know, I'm an academic advisor, but I get the opportunity to get outside of my office and do some other things. Uh, and that really keeps me, you know, I love working with students, um, but when you're doing, when you're seeing students back to back, every 15 to 30 minutes for two or three straight weeks. You get a little crazy. Uh, so it gives you, you get the opportunity to block your calendar a little bit and go work with a different committee. Uh, go work with financial aid on something that they might be doing or work with commissions on something they might be doing or housing or, or you know whatever it might be on an event, uh, anything along those lines. And I feel like everywhere I've worked, and I, and I think, it, I, I hope I can speak for everyone, encourages uh, their employees to do that because they know that there's some burnout when you're doing the same thing you know sometimes over and over again uh, so so there's always been the encouragement for me in my professional career that to just get out of your office every once in a while and get involved in something else on campus and some campuses require it uh, but just get involved and that really keeps everything fresh it keeps your mind going um, as you're going through the week Come on. what question will you give question I have is, how would you talk about a big gap in a resume, like not being a resident assistant or a graduate assistant can help you, while in an interview, or would you just avoid the topic unless it's brought up by the interviewer? Well, first off, if you're already in the interview, the interviewer has already recognized the fact that you don't have the skills in regard to being on a GA. So I don't mean to make light of that, but it meant that the employer saw something in you that certainly stuck out about your skills and your potential, or there may have been some tangible or intangible skills that you were bringing to the table that 
made more of a difference that they were curious enough to say, well, let's find out more about this person and see what they have to bring to the table and how can this person make the transition to being in housing, understand what it's like to be a living representative for the institution, knowing that he or she will become a first responder when an emergency crisis occur, knowing that they're gonna wear a number of hats, whether it's a counselor, a friend, uh, a person that has to deal with inappropriate behavior, a friend, you know, many of those things. Obviously, you've shown something that you're sitting at the table talking to an employer, and the employer is having a conversation with you. Now, chances are, there is the possibility that the employer may say, you know, I noticed that you, you don't have any direct presence life experience. But you may say, I've worked at the desk, or I helped with hall council, or I was very active with student organizations. Don't use that as a disadvantage. Bring up your skill, bring up your strengths to say, these skills have helped me to be prepared for my next adventure. And I think that as I looked at your skills and the type of job description, it fits me like a glove, using Gilbert's words about finding your hand fit in a glove. Make sure you're able to use those strengths to your advantage. Because now I'm able to say, if I look at someone that only has had Take a little different approach to this. If I'm looking at someone that only has a degree, but no outside experiences or no related experiences, in comparison to someone who has a degree plus outside experiences, chances are I'm going to look at this person more so and very closely than I am the other person. When I look at the person who may not have any res life experiences, direct res life experience, there may be some things that you may have been involved with in the community leader who may have been involved in helping to establish a GLBT organization or you may have been involved in helping to bring to the awareness about transgender awareness. And all these things you may do, you need to understand that we may be missing or we may be looking for. So there may be an opportunity for you to fill a void that we what I would just add is if you've got that gap, maybe you stopped out for a while, um, I wouldn't try to avoid it or hide it because people are going to know about that. I think be prepared to talk about what did you learn about yourself? What did you do in that time to stay connected? And transferable skills. That's all, you know, be able to articulate that while you haven't had that experience, you understand what will be required of you and these are the experiences that you think will transfer into the job. Here's a question. When the candidate is or her turn to ask questions, what questions do you get tired of hearing and answering? <laughs> to me, the, the, the simple answer is any question that really isn't sincere. My role as an employer, these roles, I could be for the 30th time I have asked, had to respond to the same question. But this is the first time you ask it. And I, as an employer, have an obligation to you to treat you with respect and to respond to that with dignity and to give you good, solid response. Nick, if I may. Honestly, I just want you to ask me a question. I don't care what it is. Um, it could be what I had for lunch, but I want you to be interested in my institution and in the position that you're interviewing for. Um, if you don't ask the question, it doesn't mean you're not interested, but when I then move to the next person and that person does ask me a question, it's like, oh, okay, this person took the time to do some research or to think about it, or, you know, and it could be, you know, tell me the best thing about your program, tell me what you like best, what, you know, tell me about the community, whatever the case is, I think just ask a question. Come prepared to ask questions. A number of panelists have already said that. But to be specific, I'm very impressed when someone, when we say, well, why are you interested in this position? If you can say, I checked out your website and I was very happy to see about you fill in the blank, that tells me that you are really interested. And I'm going to perk up a little bit more and uh, give you the um, um, attention that you deserve.
Then you were given a uh, question. I was given a question. What is the greatest skill that you should develop in yourself when working to develop others? Thank you so much. <laughs> I have been sitting here, yeah, I've been sitting here going around and around in my head what that is. And honestly, I, I think I came up maybe just with a couple of things. I do not teach student development theory at UNI. However, one of my favorite theorists is Nevitt Sanford. And his theory is challenge and support. So I believe what you really should do to help develop others as you develop yourself is to provide others with challenges. Don't do things for them. Provide them with challenges, but then also provide them the support so that they can be successful, so that they can learn from the challenge that you have given them. And I think the same thing holds true for you. So take on some different challenges, things that you might not have been interested in or think you were interested in. I remember way, 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 way back in the day, I was asked to chair a cable TV committee. We we're going to get cable TV out of campus. I know, I know, whatever. <laughs> But anyway, I thought, okay, I was three as well. <laughs> I was, I was Is that when they had rotary telephones too? And you had to get yes. up and turn the channel? Yes. And I remember thinking, all I care about TV is that I turn it on and my TV show is on. And I went into my supervisor and I said, I don't know anything about this. I'm really uncomfortable. You know what he told me? And he said, well, then change that. Fix that. Learn about this so that the next time you go into that meeting, you know what you're talking about and you can be at the table and you can be an active player. And I took that to heart, and so I, that's, I guess, what I would say is challenge yourself, challenge others, make sure that you provide the support. An open question to anybody who wants to grab this one. What is the key to balancing a graduate assistantship and graduate studies? I think one of the keys uh, in making that balance is to at the very beginning of the semester, you get your syllabi from the faculty members and you, and you develop yourself a map of what projects you have uh, and when they're going to be due throughout the semester. And then you're able to uh, organize your time uh, appropriately because you should be prepared to uh, read, I'd say, probably up to a couple hundred words, uh, not a couple words, but a couple, 200, word, 200 pages a week in your classes at the minimum. So you need to have time for your reading and, and your writing. So I think that's the key thing is, is organization. Um, grad school is hard. And I'm not saying that to scare you, it's just, it's just hard. It's hard to do all the things you need to do. And the, the thing that I learned in grad school that was hands down the most helpful thing, and this is gonna sound so stupid, is just to stop procrastinating. Just stop, just stop now. You have five minutes, you go ahead and read that chapter, okay? Because Murphy's Law will get you every time, every, every time. Um, and, and I just, I worked really hard to be super proactive in my academics, um, and, you know, getting my assignments done and doing my papers and doing my reading when I had that time to do it. Um, and really being keyed into how you are best successful um, I learned really quickly that if I had a computer anywhere near me, I was not going to get done what I needed done. So I would leave my laptop in my room and go to the library and sit and just do work. Um, and I think that that's going to be really important. Um, but I think the other thing to keep in mind, there's this sign that hangs at a desk on my campus that just says, Beyonce has the same number of hours in the day that you do. <laughs> And I was like, wow, that's, that's really true. And so I think it's like what you choose to do with your time. And you know, I've heard people say there's no such thing as balance. I think when you need a nap, you take a nap. When you need to eat, you eat. Um, and just really prioritizing the things that, that need to be done, I think is probably the, the best advice I can give from the saddest year of my life. Somebody once told me instead of balance, it's harmony. It's, it's making sure everything kind of lives together in harmony. The, the flip side to that, because several of you out there thinking, oh my god, grad school is hard, what am I doing, why am I here? Um, you're also, like, how many of you are taking five or six classes now in your undergrad, right? It's a full load. You're going to take three classes probably each semester. And you're going to be taking classes that you can apply to your assistantship, so it will make sense, it will start to click. And so sometimes you can blend your two worlds together, adding harmony to your life. So don't 
don't be totally afraid of it. I think really just jump in and embrace the learning that's happening and figuring out how do you apply it to your real job or to your assistantship. Boy, there's some good, good guidance up here. The, the one more thing that I would add would be, you know, when you hear about the projects and the papers and you need to be organized and, and all the kinds of things you'll need to do, I encourage you to look at that not as just something you have to do to get a grade. You're coming into a profession. You're going to be a professional. And it, it takes a certain amount of self-reflection in asking yourself, why am I doing this? And if you're not passionate about it, maybe it isn't the right field for you. So when you have those 200 pages a week to read, as Gilbert stated, and some of the things the other folks have said here, you need to think about getting excited about it and, and investing yourself in it. And I think that if you truly find that avenue and, and realize why you're here and what you want to do long term, it'll be a lot smoother for you and you'll actually enjoy it, despite the fact that it's a, it's a long road. But your investment in it will pay you great dividends for a long, long time if you want to go into this great profession. And that 200 pages, that's for one class. You're taking three, <laughs> 600 pages. It's only question. Okay, what challenges do you face in a career that oftentimes can demand great geographic flexibility? How have you or other professionals addressed those challenges? Um, I think this goes back to what Mary was saying about fit. Um, I think if you know that you need to stay in a particular area because you have a family or a partner or other things like that, I think your flexibility needs to come in maybe with institution size or even position. Like maybe you have your heart set on housing, but there's an academic advising job at a school that's really right where you want to be. So I think that's where your flexibility comes in. Um, but if you're not geographically tied, then I think you need to, it's more about narrowing down, right? Like it's really overwhelming to think about the fact that higher ed student affairs is literally everywhere on earth. And you could literally work anywhere. And so really thinking about those things that are important to you about fit. Do you want to be in a city? Do you want to be somewhere rural? Do you want to be in a big school, a small school? Do you want a position that requires collateral assignments with other campus offices? Or are you looking for something that's more administrative or more student focused? And there's, there's this big long list of things that are going to be important to you and will help you um, do what you're passionate about and really show off your skills and talents. Um, and I think that's kind of where you need to think about that. Um, and as someone who grew up in the Midwest and went to Mississippi for grad school, I will say with love in my heart that you can make mistakes. You might end up somewhere that you are just feeling really outside of your comfort zone. Um, and I would echo that grad school is one year, maybe three years. You can survive, I promise. But just thinking about the climate or culture of the state that you're, you know, what's happening politically? Pick up a newspaper. Um, you know, I'm sure all of you have heard about the things happening in Arizona right now that might resonate with you for certain reasons. And so thinking about those kinds of things will help you um, determine whether or not you might be successful in a region that's vastly different from, you know, maybe where you're sitting now. Spencer. So similarly, uh, as someone coming from Florida, I believe that both environmental and social transition may be hard as I've never moved. How did you go about moving alone, getting acquainted to the program, and transitioning overall? Uh, first of all, I can tell you I went eight hours from home to grad school. I'm currently 12 hours from home uh, working professionally. And it stretches you, it challenges you. But that's how you grow. Um, you, when you're away from home at a distance and if you're an OPE looking for jobs in Florida, you're probably going to be quite a distance from home. Uh, when you find your landing spot, you find out a lot about yourself. It's a lot of self-discovery. It's a lot of, you know, are you going to be that person procrastinating in your grad work? Are you going to get it done? Um, are you going to explore the city, the town, the country, wherever you're at? So there's a lot of different environments you might end up at. Think about what your non-negotiables are right now. Where do you want to land? What does that look like? Do you need to have that coffee shop down the street? to have that gym to go work out at? Do you need to have a cohort of people that you know, you're going to be able to get along with, connect with, hang out with? And that's the beautiful part about grad school. You're in that cohort field. Whatever, wherever you go, there's some sort of other grads. I can't imagine that you're going to find that department that's got that singular grad student you're in. 
Um, so really connecting with others, if that's a value for you, talk about that in interviews. When you talk about that fit piece, what is the department culture like? If the department culture, five o'clock comes around, everybody leaves the office and disappears and you don't connect outside of work, or is it one where there's that connection and communication um, piece? So think about that. But I would say it's, it's a time to grow. You know, you can do anything for two years, go somewhere new, go somewhere different, go somewhere exciting, um, or go somewhere where you're gonna get a, an excellent education. Because I'll tell you what, whether you're working professionally or grad school, especially grad school, you don't always get to see what's all around. It doesn't matter if you're going to grad school in the middle of Missouri or in Chicago. There's not a whole lot of time to like see the sites. It's do your practical work, do your grad work, see some of your friends, repeat. Or move somewhere where it's been below zero for more times in like 40 years. I'm not saying you should move to Wisconsin, you should not. But it's cold. It's very, very cold. It is great in the summer. <laughs> Fantastic. And that is what? <laughs> no, July. The 15 days of summer we have are fantastic. I have a question for you. Um, as for working with cohorts, how would you deal with some of your cohorts or other majors other than the student based higher education background? I'm going to blow your mind here. Um, my graduate experience, I went, to the, I went to Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. None of us were in higher ed there. We were all having a practical experience. Um, as running running different housing areas, but we all had different grad programs. And what we did, we took our grad programs every semester we present to the department, how we were tying what we were learning in our program, back to the department, how we could tie that in. I actually went to grad school for sports management. Um, I did my internship in campus rec, and also, but I was a huge advocate for housing. Um, Love that, I always have, but I wanted to be a diversified professional, because I was concerned what if I burned out of housing? I'd seen so many people in my life that they didn't raise life for two years, three years, and they were toast, and I didn't want that to be me. I'm not toast, I'm really excited. And I coach basketball on the side, like I, that life balance piece, I can't tell you enough. Like how, if you want to ask how did I connect to the community where I moved, um, I remember my first job, I worked for two, three months, figured out what the job was, got like my schedule set, my one-on-one set, all that, and then I went to the community and I looked for a basketball coaching position. That's something I wanted to do as a life balance piece. And I found a team, and that was something else I put on my schedule. Did it make me busier? Absolutely. But that pulled me out of the hall. It made me go do something else that wasn't res life, where when I was talking to parents or players, they weren't asking me, oh, you know, what happened in your hall last night? Or that, oh gosh, that fire alarm, that burnt popcorn. They never talked about any of that. It was, it was totally real people in the community and as a way to kind of unplug from res life, go do something else that was a passion area, and then come back to work and be <coughs> A very specific question, um, but I'm not gonna ask it because that individual has left. Oh. And that's okay. If you could have done one thing differently in your student affairs journey, what would it be? I would say for me, uh, taking more uh, quantitative uh, research courses because if you have aspirations to get that, uh, that PhD or that EDD, uh, many of those uh, doctoral programs require you to have uh, substantial uh, uh, background in quantitative or qualitative research. So if I had to do over again, I'd probably take more quantitative uh, research courses because the reality in the United States is that is the dominant paradigm for conducting uh, research. And I would just like to uh, add several more courses. <laughs> I think that's a very admirable statement. I hate, hate it quantitative analysis, <laughs> but I agree. I would have, honestly, I would have gotten my doctorate sooner. Um, and simply because I so enjoyed being back in the classroom. Um, I didn't necessarily like all the out-of-classroom activities or, you know, expectations I had to do, but I really, really liked being back in school. I liked learning, and I like having those three letters after my name so that I can then teach and have other doors open to me. I would have hired Lynn when I had the opportunity. Um, I think the thing that, that I would have done differently is to get involved professionally 
earlier in my career. I um, I'm an introvert, and I, the idea of conferences and even like sitting up here right now is like my heart is pounding. And, um, but uh, last year I got involved with UMR and I was on committee and I put the planning of the kind of annual conference and it just totally changed my whole perspective on the work I was doing on my own campus and uh, what that kind of meant in the bigger picture. And even when I came to OPE last year, I was like, wow, I know these people here now, that's really weird. Um, and so it just, it really changes everything and helps to challenge you and stay fresh in the work that you're doing. And, so I would just encourage you to find meaningful ways, what, you know, whether you land in housing or advising or somewhere else, to figure out how you can kind of get involved regionally or nationally and get connected with those other folks. So. I made a slight comment there, but I really would have liked to work with Lynn. I would have learned how to learn earlier. Value learning, read, Make the Chronicle of Higher Education your friend. And read diverse things, explore different topics. Surround yourself with individuals who think differently than you. Go ahead. Um, I guess my question is to you. Um, you were talking, I don't know. I'm an introvert, I own it. Um, but how, I know our field is very people focused, and I love that, but I am introverted. Um, how do you deal with that on a day-to-day -day basis? Like, what do you do that helps you? Um, I go home and I watch a lot of Netflix in the dark, <laughs> alone. Um, no, I, I think you just need to know when you're done. Um, and, and when you're done, you need to say to everyone, thanks, it's been a great day, and I'll see you all tomorrow. And um, I, I think you need to know your limits. And, and it, I just, you know, I know at a certain point, if I haven't eaten dinner, I'm going to yell at somebody. So I just need to, like, go and eat food and be, you know, and I think that it's fun to go and have lunch with the other area coordinators or LCs on campus, but maybe I need that 30 minutes to just not be in a conduct meeting and not be on and not be doing that. And so I think knowing, and I probably think a lot of us up here are introverts. I think that it's more common in this field than people are, are aware of. Um, and, and so I think that I know when I need to be on. I was on our welcome committee and you know, was doing events every night and it was awesome and it was fun and I like it. Um, but I just knew that like when I was done, I was done and I went home and I did things for me that were rejuvenating. Maybe that's reading for you or maybe it's singing or music or coaching or whatever that might be. Um, and making sure that you're making time for that and helping to kind of refresh yourself and reset for the next day. Use your vacation time. You know, if, if you're um, in a full-time position, they're going to probably give you vacation time. Use it, love it, <coughs> sleep in, do whatever you need to do to kind of feel good and fresh things. Bill. Yeah. This one was addressed to me, so I'm glad that you actually gave it to me. Uh, this, the, the, it goes like this, how, how did you get into academic advising, uh, the academic advising side of the field? I am currently interested in housing, but I would like to move into that area in the future. Uh, I got into academic advising, I, that's something when I, I guess I'm going to go backwards. When I was looking for something to do, and actually when I graduated from my undergrad, I moved to Maryland and I worked for a baseball team. So that is not higher education. Uh, I learned how to speak Spanish. Pretty well, but other than that, uh, the so when I, I came back home and I was really confused about what I wanted to do, and I was actually talking to my guidance counselor, and she had said you should do guidance counseling, and I said I can't work with 14 and 15 year olds, that would drive me nuts. Um, but I could do college advising, and so when I I went to graduate school with the explicit purpose of getting the education, getting the experience, and getting into academic advising. Uh, the when I started off in admissions, um, I really tried, my, my way to get out of my office was to actually start advising some students that, of the program that I graduated from that would ask me about classes and so forth um, so I could talk about my advising experience. Everyone that's here has had some sort of experience in counseling a friend, uh, one of your residents, anything along those lines. Just because you don't have academic advisor as part on your resume doesn't mean you don't advise people. Um, I work with two, I have two colleagues that I work with in, in, in our college um, that were both in Res Life and then moved into academic advising. 
uh, as, as you know, from what they would, did, and, and I asked actually my colleague the same question, and he said, just what I said, just because you're not explicitly an academic advisor doesn't mean you don't advise anyone. You can think of several instances, I'm sure, as an RA or CA that you sat down with a resident or sat down with a friend and, and talked, and they talked to you about classes or they talked to you about what was going on in their life. A lot of academic advising is, yes, I'm gonna work with you on a progression plan. The other part of it is, you know, I, one of my parents is in the hospital. My, my sister had an abortion, something along those, and there's, there's really heavy issues that you deal with. Some of them you can say, okay, you really should go to the health center for this, and some of them you can kind of just listen and talk to them, um, and it's, a lot of it goes into that. So just when, you, when you're applying for jobs and, and in the future, you know, when you get some experience and so forth, think about the advising that you've done in your life and then try to apply that to the job itself. Um, and, and that would be the way that I would say to show that experience. Another way is most graduate programs, or many graduate programs, some, you're gonna have an assistantship and you're gonna have classes, but you're gonna also have the opportunity to participate in internships or practicums. <coughs> Seek out those opportunities so you can gather those other types of familiarity with different um, fields within, uh, different um, um, offices within the um, student affairs field. That's a good way of doing that. An ethical question, Mary. No. This is for anybody. A university has offered me a position and they have given me until after OBE to accept or decline. How should I go about interviewing knowing I have this decision to make? Is this a full-time job or a graduate assistant? I do not know. If it's a graduate position, you're not forced to make that decision That's until April 15th. April 15th. So if a school is pushing you to do that and you really are torn, now obviously if you want to just have open communication, I believe it's what's most important. Um, I would, I don't, I hope nobody is doing this here. I would be careful about the school that offers you a job right here. You know, if they're forcing you to make a quick decision, they're maybe afraid they're not going to get somebody. So, uh, you know, my approach has always been, after we interview, I give candidates two or three days to think about it, let the dust settle from this weekend, call them to say, do you still remain interested? Because you can really go on this conference high and you think, oh my God, I want to work at that school. And then you step away a few days and you're like, I want to live where? And so, you know, then you realize, right? So, I, you know, I think it's a good, it's probably that Jesuit, you know, part of my work, but I think it's a really good thing to sort of reflect on and take your whole Oshkosh experience into, into play and to think about when you're not tired and you're not on this conference high, what really, after the dust settles, continues to stand out for you. I think if a school is pushing you to make a decision, I would probably back off. I remember that same conversation with the wedding dress when they were trying to push me to buy that wedding dress. And I, was like, I bet if I came back a month from now, I could still get that dress in time for the wedding. So I think it's about making good decisions for you and anything that's rushed is probably not a good decision. So clear your head, be flattered that somebody's offered you the job, but be upfront and honest if you're just not prepared to make a decision at that point in time. And I'm gonna go back, Mark, you said that there are what, 510 candidates and 600 plus jobs here. And there are over 4,000 four-year institutions in this country alone. Over 2,000 two-year institutions. So there are jobs out there. Um, it doesn't mean that this job offer that you have is not the best job ever. And you, you know, maybe you do wanna take it and that's fine, but just give yourself the chance to, to make it a, an informed decision. I would take this opportunity to really evaluate the institutions that you're also interviewing with, and it may be that this is some um, position you want. I don't think you interview with a, a school thinking, well, I'll see what they have to offer. Don't waste your time or their time. But um, you, you need to go in this with your eyes wide open. And if you're not prepared to make a decision, you tell them that institution and I have a little bit more time to think about this. And we'll see what happens. <laughs> what is the student affairs stance on standardized tests such as the GRE compared to a school, like a graduate school, actually requiring it? 
Um, can you talk about uh, um, schools that will require a GRE or that sort of thing on standardized tests for admittance for graduate school? Well, I've worked at uh, several institutions that require the GRE, and it's more so an issue on how the institutions use the GRE in regards to admissions decisions. Do you look at it as being the uh, only thing that's going to determine a candidate's admission to the program, or do you look at it in combination uh, with factors such as uh, undergraduate GPA? So I, that's one way to take a look at it. One of the problems with going to a program that does not require the GRE is you have to kind of look at, well, what's going to be the uh, competitive uh, environment in the classroom? You know, because the students sometimes will be attracted to a program that they perceive to be less rigorous. So how does that matter? How does that shape the, the classroom environment? I think the, uh, the GRE has been around a long time. It's a, it's, a, it's a good major for certain kinds of things. We don't require it. Uh, there is some data that might suggest it doesn't necessarily predict uh, success in graduate school, but it's one more measure to look at in, in a more of a holistic um, review of what a candidate brings to a program. Um, we do require the Miller Analogies Test, which is what we refer to as the MAT, which provides an opportunity for us to to consider how well you can take a scenario and conceptualize different components of it. But we also, we don't place all of our eggs in one basket where there's a you know, necessary cutoff score right there and that's it. We look at lots of different kinds of things, including your written supplement and many other kinds of things. Um, I don't know what, what most programs are requiring out there right now as far as the GRE goes uh, in, in counseling or in student affairs or even in higher education administration. So you might, that's a good question. And you might want to look at programs and go to their websites and see what they really do require. And see how they use them. So one of the reasons why it took me so long to go back for my doctorate was because I did not want to take the GRE. I never had, didn't want to, I waited. Finally realized that the program I wanted to go to, the graduate college required it, the program did not. So I paid my money, walked in, spent one hour taking the GRE, walked out, I was done. Um, I think you get 200 points on the analytical section just for showing up, so I got that. Um, <laughs> So I, I, that's one of the things where I'm sad. It took me so long. It was required, but it was not utilized. So find out kind of what the school does with it. And I agree, the schools that do use it, I think they use it in conjunction with other things. And I'm really sorry my bride is out there waiting for me, so I have to leave. But if you see me around and feel any specific questions for me, I'm absolutely happy to continue to answer your problems. Thanks, Mary. Gilbert, I think we have the last question, and then we'll take questions. Uh, the question is, are two masters, one in student affairs and higher education, and professional counseling beneficial? I don't think so. My, I ended up with two masters degrees uh, through serendipity. You know, uh, I was able to earn the first master's degree, and then I was able to uh, take part of those requirements and to meet the uh, degree requirements at the other institution. It more so is uh, just trying to keep myself busy while my wife was working on her uh, her PhD, so I was just trying to stay busy. But and the reality I say today is that a lot of master's programs, particularly those exemplary ones that require 42 to 48 hours, is usually uh, a couple of classes in the that are required to have a the, from the counseling program, and also there may be some electives where you can take some additional courses in counseling. That would be the pathway I would recommend is that you uh, get the overall administrative focus and take some courses in the counseling program because you do need skills and work with individuals on a one-on-one -on -one basis or in small groups, and you can, you can sharpen your skills to take those courses. Yeah, the question.
question is, should you go straight through undergrad, master's, doctor? No. Get your master's degree if that's what your plan is. And then work. Um, spend some time working. Get, get some experience. And honestly, a lot of doctoral programs will expect that. They will expect some work experience that you will be able to bring in, some life experiences. And then go back. And again, you know, if you go back full time, I went back part time. I had a program where I would take two or three classes a semester, but one class would meet three times on a Thursday, Friday over the course of about six weeks. And so I just took some vacation, drove to the program, and was able to get things done. So um, I think it is important to take some time off, if nothing else, to recoup, to rest, to relax, to enjoy some Netflix, whatever it is that you like to do. Uh, I think a lot of it depends on what you want to do. One of the uh, preeminent uh, scholars in uh, higher education today, Sean Harper, uh, fraternity brother of mine, he, he has very little uh, administrative experience, but if you look at the body of his work, what he's writing and teaching in higher education, uh, he's one of the preeminent uh, young scholars uh, today. So if you, you're interested in the faculty track, I don't necessarily think that uh, having a lot of administrative experience is, is important. One thing, you just have to know what you're interested in, but if you seek to be a chief student affairs officer, I think uh, it's really important that you do gather some uh, experiences, you know, along the way so you can have uh, some credibility when you're working with uh, people who you seek to uh, supervise. <clears throat> other questions out there? I know we're getting close to that 8 o'clock hour, so other, any other questions? Thank you for coming. I want to remind you of something that Tyrone mentioned before this session. We have the Minority and Friends Network advice booth. It's in Brunhagen. If you have any questions at any time in the next couple of days, stop in. The friendly people are going to um, respond to your questions. If you have a concern, that would be happy to. Um, um, a number of us as professionals um, um, who are um, Minority and Friends Network um, sponsors, we, we volunteer um, for an hour or so sitting at the booth. We like to, to sit and chit chat and um, engage with uh, our young professionals. Um, if you could join me in thanking our. our